I don't care who you are, it does get to you at some stage. Your circle gets smaller, it gets closer, and I would say just protect that circle. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. And I think someone's going to tell you no, someone's going to say to you yes. So just keep going. From Bethnal Green, the Aladdin's Cave of the East End, serving customers such as Bugsy Malone, Charlie Sloth. We have Judd from Trotters. Judd, your come up has been amazing. Uh, what could be seen as a, a normal, normal boy growing up and actually just taking the jewellery industry by storm because you don't have the typical background. Because this isn't Hatton Gardens, this is Bethnal Green and you, most people would feel like you couldn't start a jewellery business there. Talk to me about your journey, about your beginning and welcome. Thank you, thanks for having us today <laughs> anyway. It's, it's good to be here. Um, wow, the journey, how do I start? So I got brought into the jewellery world from a family member, from my dad, but I wasn't interested in jewellery as such. My obsession is watches. That's the background that I love. That's what I'm obsessed with to this day. I now, see you have some very big timepieces on your wrist. I'm obsessed. I, I absolutely love them. So one for each wrist today. But yeah, so whatever we can do that involves a watch, I'm What's interested. the time? Well, uh, you want Scotland <laughs> time or London time? We're both I the same I've either, heard today. Worry. So yeah, so no, this is, this is my cup of tea and this is where I'll make my uh, statement pieces now, yeah. Okay, I see you, blue one, green one, we're out here. Some of us are green with envy. Trotter's green. Yeah, oh. Trotter's oh, green. A little bit of branding that's going my colour, that's my colour. But how was the transition? Like, you, well, loved, you loved watches, your family was in the jewellery business. Well, it all started off at school, really. So I started selling lower brands like Aquamasters. So that's yeah, a... Yeah, them. Yeah, I think, I've got to be honest, I think if you lived in London and you wanted to be a little bit icy back in the day, that was certainly the piece to have. I think I actually got my Aquamaster from Trotters. It most likely was, because yeah. we, we wholesaled them everywhere and I was even sending them out my backpack in school. So this is where it started. So a couple of my friends bought them in my circle and then before you know it, I'm serving the year above, I'm serving the year below. Then I'm serving straps at my backpack. Then the school told me off. You know, I had to sell straps at <laughs> school. I was like, okay, no big deal. I'm not selling drugs. You know, I'm selling a, a product. So that's where my obsession started, I would say, really. And it started from a watch that I was selling at like £295, which, all right, I might have earned £25 saving up by myself a pair of trainers. I think that's where the buzz kicked in. I was like, right, how far can I really push this? So I think. You know, when you first start, you can't just walk in and go, I'm going to sell a Richard Mill, 100K, because you're not in the market. When I was at school, my friends had £20 lunch money, not £1,000, you know, so to save up for a watch for £295, that's a lot of money. So I was in the right category at the right time. And I would say for the next year or two, it really did take a lot of trial and errors of learning the trade, learning the brands, learning the models, because we've all made mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes to get where I am today, a hell of a lot. But if you don't get over your mistakes and move on with it quickly and go on to the next deal, you're just going to be held up and take it as a grudge on your previous deal, which you don't need. You don't, don't do it from my advice. Move on. You're selling watches, but then, as you said, there comes a time where you start to build, um, I guess, a, a client base. Yeah. You're getting a bit older, going to college, I'm assuming. Didn't go to college, or, no. Or, or, or your friends are going to college, so it's that true. kind of ages, right? So, like, I'd say, like, my friend category sort of split up. Different directions. Some went college, some went university. You know, some went professional footballers. So the, the way I looked at it, the market got bigger. Because now my friends are going to recommend me to their friends. Now that person at the college is going to recommend me to their friends at college. So at the time, I think it was Blackberries, BBM. Putting my status. People putting status, sitting indoors bored, or well, I'm sitting there selling an Aquamaster, or I'm sitting there selling that, or I want to buy your watch that you're selling. And it might have been, for example, an Omega or a Breitling, which is a little bit more affordable for me at the time because Rolex was still two, three thousand pounds. So it took me a while to build up from a 295 pound watch up to sell like a thousand pounds. It didn't come overnight, it definitely didn't. And when I got there, I still made a few mistakes. It took, I would say, at least two to three years before I've really felt, I know which direction I'm going in now, this is my lane and I want to push on with it. 
And it weren't until social media turned on its side. I was on Twitter, sitting there in the shop, pretty bored because the East End attracts characters. So we'd be sitting <laughs> in the shop, you'd come in, someone sell gold tooth, they're like, putting the gold tooth out. Like, I'm not interested in that, that's not my <laughs> cup of tea. I'm not a dentist, you know, I want to be a, a jeweler stroke watch expert. So I was sitting there one day and I was on Twitter, and a guy came in and was like, you need to get off Twitter. Get off Twitter. And I was like, really? We've got like 4,000 followers. I think I'm doing okay. So I get on Instagram. I don't remember this guy's name and I owe him a lot. So if he's out there and he's watching and it's the truthful guy hits he's out gonna to give me. going to give you one of the real RMs. So, yeah, no, no, you're probably guaranteeing RMs, but I mean, he, I owe him a lot. So he needs to come out and hit me up. But it was, it was guiding me and it was it's a free, you know, it's free advice at the day. And he told me to get on Instagram. And from that moment onwards, something happened. It was the right time, the right place. Everything all connected at once. But don't get me wrong. I'm on there 24-7. I, I would call it a unhealthy habit. I'm addicted. But if you want to be in a position where you can have nicer things and do better for yourself, something has to give. So my dad's old school. He's traditionally from the East End, so he taught me all the tricks of the trade. He gave me the insight of the business before I had to learn the harsh reality. But he was the best tutor to me because he gave me the harshest lessons. You know, when I was 18, 19, People was going out partying on Friday and Saturday. I had to be in work. Christmas time from September. You're in the shop working Sundays. My friends was going parties. I was going to watch shows in Germany or Miami or New York. You know, so, okay, I missed a few birthday parties. I missed a few 18th, I missed a few 21st birthdays, but I'm over that now because of the position I'm in today. So my dad gave me a position where you can have, you can get to that target a lot easier but you need to want it yourself. And I think that's honestly the thing with this today's generation. You've really got to want it yourself. You can't just have something handed to a platter to you. It's not going to happen. And if you want to maintain it, it's all about what you put in yourself. And do you think that those were the things that were kind of playing on your mind at the time? Now, if you go back and you think of Judd at that age, um, you know, when it's kind of like a pinnacle point for you, because you're, mm. you're, you're having a conversation with yourself at that stage, it's like, I want to go out, these lot are holding me back, but I understand that this is doing some good for me. Or it's I'm true, it's, it's a happy medium. So uh, don't get me wrong, I did go out some nights. Some nights I'll probably come in too late and suffered the next day, but it's part of learning, I think, especially as a young adult, as a young lad living in London, you have to enjoy it as well. I still do enjoy life, you know, there's no doubt about it, but my whole point, I think, from 18 to 21 as a young lad in London or in England, I would say people treat you differently as you get a little bit older. And I went from being a young boy to a young man, and there's a big difference. Don't think you're going to sit in and be straight away head of the table. It doesn't happen in any business that I know, anyone. So it took a lot of learning, a lot of listening, and that's where I am today. Give me an example of one of those moments for you. My first ever watch show. So I had a budget, I've gone in the room the first day, first couple of hours, blew my budget, blew it. Straight away, I bought the best watches, I'm on the phone to my friends, I've got this watch, I've got that watch. If I'd have waited and been patient and waited till the second day, I probably would have got them watches, I'd say at least 20, 30% less, because I bought the stock that nobody wanted. <laughs> so I'd have got them for less the next day when they would have been panic selling. So that comes with experience. Yeah, and that was your tuition fee, right? So some people were pay busy paying for college, you were busy paying for, for tuition fees at, at, at watch. It was my, well, it's, it's, I say tuition fees, it's my, it was my life, you know? It's like, it was my own, I had overheads, I've got bills to pay, you know, I had a rent to pay for in the shop, et cetera, bills, staff members. So if I made mistakes up until three or four months, I've got the next quarter to look forward to. Now I've got to get over these mistakes and go again and go again. And if I want to hold an investment piece, I've then got to be double smart because if that investment doesn't pay off, then more for me and more for my team around me. There was a moment where you took over from your dad. That's right, yeah. So you was working with your dad, it's going great. And then you were like, you know what? It was, it, was it you saying, oh, I want to take over, or was it your dad saying, you're doing so great, you can take over the, the, the reins? I don't remember exactly the conversation as such, but I remember it was in 2011, and I wanted to take the company in a different direction to what he led, like, what he originally gave me the rein to. So in 2011, we'd done the paperwork, we agreed a figure, I agreed to purchase the company off him within a certain amount of time, which I did, um, and then I took the company in the own, my own direction. So. 
I would say it took me at least two to three years to really put my stamp on the company to maintain the bills, pay everyone, get everyone satisfied, pay like everything that needs to be done and then take it in the direction that I wanted to take it in. Where did you get the money to, to buy the, the, the company from your dad? Or did you, was it a formality or did you actually have to buy it from him? Well, I wasn't given a golden spoon, but I was definitely given a golden opportunity. Okay, right. So with my dad, he gave me terms. So he gave me like a two to three year contract. Uh, he wants this amount of money within this time for a certain amount of stock. So I was very, very lucky. Don't get me wrong. I think for most people out there, if they was given the same opportunity as me, I'd, I'd call my four if they didn't take it. But don't get me wrong, there were some weeks we didn't do good. And there were some weeks I'd think, oh, even though it's my dad, he's not the easiest person in the world and he's still got to be paid. It was a business deal regardless of a family situation. So I managed to pay it quicker off than expected. And then the... The sooner I paid it off, the sooner I had my full grip on the company. Then I could take it in my direction. And that's what I wanted. That's what I had to drive for. And I love that you spoke about the fact that the stamp took like two years. Because I think people mm. think that you have a mastermind, you take over the reins, and then automatically everything's Not gonna changed. Happen. But you've got an existing customer base, and then you have a new customer base that you want to attract, and you have to find that middle point, I'm assuming, so initially. It was hard to juggle the pair. It really was because it's taken years and years. So this is going back to 2011, we're in 2021. So if anybody thinks they're gonna open a business or take over a business and hit the ground running within the first year, it's probably a 1% chance. It's not gonna happen. And all businesses come to pros and cons. So not to put a downer on it, but don't, don't feel bad if it doesn't work out the first time, you know? Don't let it get you down. At the end of the day, it's just business you get to go again, there's another opportunity. And if you're all negged out and you're not in a good headspace, the next opportunity coming towards you, you're gonna deflect it. So you need to be there, you need to be up early, you need to be there is number one. Definitely be there. But being positive is definitely like a main factor I think you've gotta to be to take it to the next level. How much time did you have to spend in the shop in the earlier days? Six days a week. Six days a week, definitely. And how were you juggling like the being in the shop, going to shows mm, and, and general hustling about like because I'm sure that wasn't it I'm sure there were other things that were happening <laughs> running up and down sometimes to kind of try and sell a watch if, to, a, to a big client or something it's true so my favorite thing is sleep and I need a lot of sleep I do <laughs> of I used to is. get in and some of my friends who are even here today with me they'll know for a fact it's the absolute truth I used to get in I used to go to work at 8 a.m so it's take me an hour to travel in so up at 7 or 6 30 do a full day at work, no lunch break, get home around seven, eight o'clock, bed, not wake up till the next morning, repeat the cycle, that's just the way it was. And let's go, how are you going to sleep as you're getting from work? I don't get it. <laughs> I was like, I'm done, my head's drained because when you're focusing so much, you stress. And I think when I was younger, I would get home and still be thinking about work, where now I get home and I switch off from work because I'm at the level now where I think, I'm like, this night's mine. I go back to office in the morning. We go again. You know, that's, that's part of life. But in the very beginning, I would let that get at me. And I think it was more of the obsession of trying to prove a point early doors. It was a good, it was a bee in my bonnet and I, had to, it, it was, I was chasing it, basically. I love that. I, I, I'm really interested, though, because as a, as a young man who has a jewellery business, bit fly, um, how were you keeping the other distractions at bay and other distractions, you know what I mean? I mean, the ladies, like, how was you keeping them on um, chill or was you? It wasn't my focus as such. If I'm hungover, if I'm tired, if I broke my ankle, I've got to get up and go to work. That's, that's the role model my dad embedded in me. If you want to have an established business that's trusted, that's loyal, that's it's going to be an empire one day, you can't have days off, you can't have excuses, you can't go to a business and go, oh, well, Tesco's is closed today because someone's got a cough or maybe this day and age because of COVID. But I mean, back then it was like, there's, there's no excuses basically. And I think that you need to be very ruthless when it comes to that, you need to set a standard. And then as someone who's, you know, started my own business journey really early on, um, there's a lot of times where I would like, my friends who graduated and have gone on to complete their vocations, you know, when I was having those doubting moments, I was like, why didn't I just do that? Oh, I've Did, had were there any of those for you? Don't get me wrong, I've sat there like one of my friends has turned pro football, I was like, oh my God, he's got the best job in the world. 
Then some other friends have gone to college or university. They're finishing at three o'clock and they're going in and, Judd, where are you? It's Friday. We're like, why don't you come out for drinks? And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm working all day and I'm getting like, oh, I'm getting an extra £20 extra day than what my friends are getting. But I had, I had to look into the future rather than what's happening right there in the bigger picture. And I knew what I was building. And I think when I when it started to really get going and it started building quicker and quicker, my mindset quickly got taken off of the distractions, so like nights out, girlfriends, friends, cars and stuff, because that was, I was like, right, now I can see, I'm going, I'm in my lane now. And I was like, right, I'm not going to let my competition, I'm not going to let my friends, I'm not going to let no one distract me, even my family. And I think I just sort of zoned in. That was it. I was just, I was in that moment. Impressive. I think that that's the stage that decides whether or not you're going to be a, a, an entrepreneur for the rest of your life or not, um, is that decision making is like, where's everybody going? It's true. Um, because I'm, I feel like I've been here and you were there from so young. Were there any times where you just felt like, I actually just want a change of environment? Yes. So that's <laughs> happened quite recently, but I've done fine. I've achieved more than what I thought I would have at this age. But earning money doesn't necessarily make you happy. And if that's where it got to the stage. I was like, you know what? I don't want to keep going to East London. I don't want to keep hustling and bustling in Bethnal Green. I've got a fruit and vegetable outside and I'm trying to deliver footballers, VIPs and billionaires to Bethnal Green High Road. I've done my best. <laughs> I knew I've, I, in my environment, with I've done the absolute best. I've pushed it to the limit and some time for a change. Is that when the London flagship store? Yes. It's something that wasn't easy because change is not easy. Why change when something's good? Mm -hmm. I could have stayed in Bethnal Green. Could have earned a living for another 10, 15 years, no problem. But I wanted a change. I think 10 years is enough. Not a lot of people spend 10 years in a career. So I thought that was a long time to be in one certain shop. So I made the decision with me, Callum and Alex. Yeah, me, Callum and Alex at the time, to move to Liverpool Street, which is only one station away. But it was such a huge step up the ladder in terms of business, in terms of everything. So we call it the penthouse by Trotters. We've got a roof terrace, we've got a lounge, we've got over 250 luxury watches on show. Bang, we put it up on Instagram, it just hit the ground running. We just, we've literally haven't stopped for the past 18 months. Have not stopped. How much of your business is dependent on social media? Well, I would say this past year, 90 to 95%. That's crazy. Very, very different business model from your dad's foot flow model, yes. right? Yes, yes. We don't have a store that you can walk in no more. It's by appointment only, or if you call us and we've got space, we'll get you in because we're in an office building. So it's completely changed the motto, and that was the hardest thing to switch off for stop customers just knocking on the door, pushing a doorbell. I'm going to miss that, 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 oh, that market store experience, though. Bought two, two of my ex-boyfriend's chains from there. I was in there. I was a Trotter's yeah, we're, resident. We're, we're all attached to it. You know, <laughs> we're it's, all it's, attached. it's embedded in here. But, uh, you know, we speak about really glamorous things now. We're speaking about high-value items. But you yourself, you know, must have had some hardships. I know uh, COVID is, like, one of the most recent ones. Mm. But your early years, because... I think it's always important to understand how to get past that initial mindset, the, bit, the bits where you're getting slapped in the face and you ain't even earned anything. Talk to me a little bit more about those. Well, I think when you're especially when you talk to the youngsters and they go like, oh, I don't want to get the train to work or I want to do this, like, be humble. I used to drive to work. There was one week where I, I drove to work, I barely had enough money to put petrol in my car because I got so many parking tickets. I had congestion charge. And it got to the point at the end of the week and I nearly give up. And I was thinking, if I, if I give up now and I can't pay my parking ticket and my petrol and just life in general, then wh what am I doing? If you can't control that, then don't try and control a business. That's, that's the truth of it. But you need to get your priorities right. So why am I driving in London? Get on the train. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually quicker. I had more time. Well, I've been doing it for years. Like why, like, why change now? I've still got some friends now. I'd never get on a train. I'm Really? Why not? That's really good. So being able to have those conversations with yourself. Um, and I think that as entrepreneurs, we all go through that. It's the, those moments where you're like, 
Am I like? Am I okay? Like, because you feel like you're in a bit of a bubble, right? It's true. Like, is this the real world? And some people will say it to you, like, you're not, you're not being realistic, Judd. Like, have you thought about the future? Have you thought about when you get married? Or, like, how how does that go? And you you like, you answer them in the moment, but you have that those second thoughts to yourself and those questions, like, am, like, am I a bit tapped? Am it's I true. <laughs> you know, you do get lost in the sauce as such. Like, you do. Like, you know, everybody wants a lifestyle, and I'm gonna be spotting on the train or this or that, and. I'm so over that now. I'm so over it. I'm just, I'll go with the flow. And if anything, I think it's a lot more relaxing. But if well, you... it's a lot easier when you've got a couple of houses on your wrist, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't just get these overnight. Don't get me wrong. I did not just get these overnight. But don't, just don't give up, you know? And I think the earlier the lesson, the better. Because once you get over that lesson and you don't go back from it, I think the only way is up from there. And then what's the plans for the future? Well, basically, so we've done the penthouse. We've been there 18 months. We've got a five-year contract under our belt with that. But the main goal I'd say in the next, I would say in the next three years, realistically, is to have Trotters HQ. And um, yeah, Trotters to the world. There's, there's no coming back. You spoke about like some of your footballer friends. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a number of other superstars that come into Trotters. It's true. For the full Trotters experience. Um, who are they? Who are those people? Who have you sold to? A lot of, of them have been rappers and Premier League footballers as such. We do get surprised sometimes. The biggest name we've probably ever had in was in our Bethnal Green branch, believe it or not. And I wasn't there. Uh... But I did get to meet this guy. His name is Bernie Eccleston. Ooh. Yep, he was Formula One's billionaire, you know, legend. Big deal. He just walked in the store. And that was in Bethnal Green. And then it was like at that moment I was realised, hang on a minute. This is where, like, we need to have a showroom or a, a headquarters or a place for these guys to come and feel comfortable. Where Bethel Green, as you've been in the shop before, there's a fruit and vegetable outside and there's vest next doors. And it's like, it's too much craziness going on. Even though I love the craziness, but it wasn't the right place to bring these VIP clients as such. But recently, since we've had the penthouse showroom, we've had like, yeah, Jack Graylish in, Ben Chilwell, we've had rappers dig a D, dig that. You name it, we've had so many big names come in the past year because they've seen us on the internet, they've seen us on Instagram, YouTube, and they, they're like, oh, what have Trotter's done? That looks cool, I wanna hit them up. It might have not been somebody I've spoke to in the past two or three years because they still thought we was in that old little shop. But now we've updated and it's cool, they all want to come and hang out. It's the, it's the feel good factor. We feel better, you feel better. And I guarantee you nine out of 10 people leave that show with a smile on their face and they've, they're coming back. It's the whole experience. Yeah, I mean, I believe that, but the smile happens in that moment until you get home and you revisit the bank balance. I'm like, Charmaine, oh, no, seriously, that, have you done this again? That's the moment again? where you get there, like, huh, what, <laughs> really? Like, oh, but then, you know, back then to you the But then you can tell the time, right? Even it's if it's good. on it your right hand. Good. It feels good, it feels right hand, left hand, <laughs> whatever you want, but it feels good. It, it, well, I think it does to the clients, it's a feel good factor. That could be very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, one last question um, that I have for you is, what advice would you give to young Judd that you think that no one gave you that could have shaved off like five years from your journey? Wow. Um, what advice? I would say just, just do you. Less, listen to a less than what people say and the, the rumours and the animosity that goes around because the better you do, it does come with hatred, unfortunately. It really does. And... I don't care who you are, it does get to you at some stage. Your circle gets smaller, it gets closer. And I would say to protect that circle. You know, it, you really need to have a strong group of friends and family around you. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. And I think as long as you've got that as a stability, you can take it to wherever you want, literally wherever you want. And someone's going to tell you no, someone's going to say to you yes. So just keep going. And to wrap up, you you speak very eloquently, but you still speak with a Cockney accent. And I feel like that's something that's really important to me is kind of keeping that authenticity. I mean, if it wears off, it wears off. But when you're in the diamond and the watch business in a very luxury, high-end arena, was there any, ever any times where you felt like you should lose that? Um, and what is it that helped you to kind of think, you know what, fuck it, I'm me and I'm doing a great job anyway? Have to adapt. One million percent you have to adapt and I'll tell it to anybody out there trying to run a business now because if you walk in and you've got bad attitude from day one or you've got roadman attitude or cockney attitude, 
Someone from South's not going to like someone from East. So change that straight away. Change, change your attitude or your, your, your style to the situation, you know? And I think that comes with age and confidence. I think if you're too narrow-minded and it's your way or the highway, then your business is going to do 20% of what it should do. Definitely. Oh, thank you for that. I always think it's really important for people to understand that you can be yourself. Adapting is very different to changing. Yeah. Um, and it is good to see a, a, a Cockney boy doing amazing things. So well East done. London, why um, not? Let's, let's, let's cheers let's to... Let's cheers. Thank you for having me today. And, and for the fact that you're, you're, you're going to donate me an RM, right? I need one of those. What? <laughs> <laughs>